it's unfortunate that we have this legal issue behind the tactical issue, uh, but that's, that's the world we live in for now. Welcome to Uncensored Tactical, where our goal is to talk about training, tactics, and more without being limited by red tape or a sterile bureaucratic environment so that we can bring you value and insight in a way that other organizations just plain can't. Okay, as always, very short housekeeping up front. Uh, disclaimer, there will be adult language and adult content in this episode, as well as all the other episodes that we do. Uh, another quick shout, our Patreon subscription service really helps us keep the lights on. Uh, this show is quite expensive behind the scenes. If you found some value in today, head over to patreon.com backslash UTAC to support us at even the $2 level. That would be so helpful. Uh, all other housekeeping uh, and dog updates, if if we have time, will be done at the end of the episode. So we are in, and part one of the content would be, what are we drinking? And since it's about 10 o'clock-ish on a weekday, I am drinking some coffee. I have some maple-flavored coffee beans that I grind, and I do a little bit of vanilla, vanilla almond milk and some sugar, and that's it. Super simple. And that little bit of racket you hear. In the background should be Arrow hanging out in her crate with the door open. She just loves it. She just hangs out there. Okay, topic for today is the debate between open carry and concealed carry. So if you're not familiar with that, let's just start by defining both sides of the debate. Uh, So this is really, really common in the gun world. Um, It's common on internet forums. Uh, It's common in real life when people meet up. So... The unfortunate part is that it's also tied to legal debate, which is just a hot mess. So we'll define both sides of the argument. Side A, or people that are pro-concealed carry, they make the argument that, well, if you open carry, then you make yourself a target for an active shooter, and then you'll be targeted first, and you won't be able to defend yourself. Okay, so that's roughly that. I have heard that dozens and dozens of times in my life. Uh, side B, or the people that are pro-open carry, they will say, well, I can get to my gun quicker if it's open carry. Uh, it's easier. It's an easier lifestyle to just say, let me strap a gun on the outside of my belt instead of let me tuck my shirt in and do this special holster and tuck it into my, my four o'clock, my, you know, my appendix carry, my ankle. So it's more comfortable. It's usually easier, easier to get to. Um, and the pro-open carry side will often say, I can deter a gunfight before it starts just by being present and being armed. That's really the major part. I should have opened with that. <laughs> so we have two sides. One says, if you open carry, you won't be able to defend yourself because you'll get targeted first. The other side says, if I open carry, there might not even be a fight because they might see me and decide against it. Just by defining that, just by talking about both sides, it, it is immediately clear to me that we have kind of a hiccup in logic here in which both sides can be correct. They can both be right at the same time and they can both be right at different times. So, uh, and they both, they both also have their flaws. That's pretty much going to be the conclusion at the end of this show, which is both sides can be right. Both sides can be wrong. They both have pros and cons, obviously. Right. Um, and you don't have to get, uh, Uh, Your panties all knotted up. It's going to be okay. Let's hash this out a little bit more before I go deep on that conclusion. Open carry can stop a gunfight before it starts. Uh, And we see that. I mean, you don't even need to look look at numbers or statistics. We have cops on the street. They do open carry. There have been times when criminals have said, I'm going to go commit this crime or shoot somebody. And they see a cop and they go, oh, better not. Maybe later. Yes, that's really clear. We know that happens. You know what's interesting, though, is I would I would love if someone out there has more information than me. I would love for you to share it, but I have never heard in any of the debrief... Ooh, that putz. Like, sorry, guys. I have never heard in any of the debriefs or any of the articles or books... Um, on any of the active shooters, like school shooters or, you know, workplace shooters or any of that, I have never heard a comment along the lines of, well, the shooter said, let me go find who has a gun and let me shoot them first. 
and then it'll start killing everybody else. That's really, that's gotta be really rare, right? So for you to be targeted, if you're open carrying by an active shooter, you would probably have to be the first one that they see, or they would have to do like an advanced, you know, an advanced sweep or recon or, you know, advanced Intel checks. Hey, we're going to go shoot this place up. Oh, maybe we should see if there's anyone there that's open carrying. Like that's, that sounds fucking crazy. Um, it also depends on who your bad guy is and who you want to defend against. So of course we've seen cases where people that are armed in any fashion have stopped active shooters and just killed them dead in their tracks. So regardless of your stance, uh, either one, I think you should be pro carry a weapon, however you carry it. I don't want to get too far off track, but let me check my notes here. This might be a short episode. Yeah, let me scroll down a little bit. So the unsolvable problem with this debate being it's better to open carry. No, it's better to conceal carry. The unsolvable problem here is that the, the debate, excuse me, is based off of two different types of gunmen and two different types of events with very specific inputs and leaving out other inputs. Um, let's, let's give a scenario where open carry might be better. So let's say a group of young men who are full of vigor and ready to break the law and murder somebody and steal some money. Let's say they pull up to the side of a gas station. And let's say, let's say maybe they are armed, right? With shitty high points or whatever, or guns that they're not familiar with and don't know how to use. And they get these guns and they're in their, and they're in their car. They're waiting to jump out and go into the gas station and do a shooting right past the car walks someone who's not even, let's say it's not even someone that's super big or muscular or tough or manly, but it's just a, a dude. And he's got a big ass fucking full size glop glop. <laughs> Jesus. I'll take a sip of my coffee, a glop. That's nice. So dude has a full size glock on his hip, open carry walks right past that car. Cause he's not, not looking into the tinted windows to see who's in there. He's just walking into the gas station. If you're one of those young men in the car that's ready to go commit that crime, what do you think is more reasonable? Oh, we should shoot him first. Or, hey, let's wait till this guy leaves. So even if the other party is armed, being open carry and armed might still stop that problem before it starts. Uh, there are some situations where I think concealed carry could be a bad thing, right? You could still, (laughs) it's morbid, but it's funny. So you could be, you know, at a church or whatever, and you could be concealed carry and an active shooter could come in and randomly he could fucking shoot you right in the dome first, just by sheer luck. And then what good does your concealed carry do? Right? (laughs) No good. So I don't, it's not funny that people get murdered like that, but the, the logic is, oh, if I'm concealed carry, then I'll surprise the bad guy by saving the day, which like, I'm not anti concealed carry. and I'm not anti open carry. I'm just really trying to discuss both sides of the issue. Uh, So the logic is flawed in a couple ways so far that we've seen. Um, Let's do this. Uh, I'm going to pause because I have to check my notes for one second. Yeah, let's do this one. Okay. Uh, If any of you out there have ever done... uh, I got any force on force training like the simunitions or the marking cartridges um, or even blank firing. If you're active in that scenario, right, you're doing your room clearing or your scenario rooms and you go in and you start shooting and it's like, oh, bad guy, he's pointing a gun right at me. Bang, bang, bang. Uh, rounds are coming in, rounds are going out. Even at that level, I think it would be hard to to get a mass gathering of people like 20, 30, 40 people. And even if you wanted to be the bad guy, I think the mindset would be go in, shoot as many people as possible. I don't think in your mind you would have the room or just the cognitive ability to multitask and to go, okay, I'm going to walk into this church or wherever, and I'm going to shoot as many people as I can while also examining everybody's hip and belt line and t-shirt bulge. And I'm just going to, fooey that plus, leave it. 
I'm going to examine everyone's belt line and I'm sorry, let me handle this one second. What are you doing? Plutz, bite, relax. Good plutz. Sorry for the interruption. So I think it would be really difficult to examine everyone and to go, while I'm murdering these people, and while I'm worried about maybe one of them murdering me back, I don't know, uh, but while I'm monitoring this situation as the active shooter myself, I don't know if you have the mental space to go. I'm also on the hunt for anyone open carrying because I'm going to go bring the gunfight to them. We, we actually have the opposite evidence a lot of times, which is, oh my God, the police are coming. I'm just going to kill myself. So... I think the people that are anti-open carry, so the people that are pro-concealed carry, I think they have probably more more flawed logic on their side. But again, you, they can still be right. Absolutely, they can still be right. Um, I do think if you're if you're open carrying, you draw yourself, you draw attention to yourself. But I don't know if it's that you draw an assassin's bullet to your brain first. So again, there's a lot left out in this argument, and there's a lot of um, there's a lot of room for both sides to have a, a, a much more thorough explanation. So this episode might not have the most um, chronological order, but I do have another note I want to dive into here, which is we have evidence that people conceal carry. I'm sorry, we have evidence that people open carry every single day in this country. We have a couple different groups of people. We have people in concealed carry states and cities that are just regular old civilians and they carry. And as far as I know, they don't get murdered every day because they're open carrying. Man, I hope I haven't mixed these words up, I think. Open, concealed, open, concealed. Uh, We also have police officers that open carry every single day of their career. We have police officers on the street every single day that are open carrying. And so my question to you is, if you're anti-open carry, are you also anti-cop open carry? Because if the logic is... If you have a gun then on your, visible on your hip, then you make yourself a target. If that is your logic, then I believe it must also mean that you are pro having uniformed police officers conceal carry their weapon underneath their shirts, which is a little odd, right? And if you don't believe that, then why would, why would it also not, if cops can open carry, why would civilians not be allowed to open carry? And I know that there's a lot of mental gymnastics that happen here, right? Lots of loops, lots of weird backwards logic or linear, non-circular logic, whatever you want to fucking call it. Just stuff that's not thoroughly thought out. We have a huge group of people in this country that open carry every single day of their career. So maybe we take a look at them instead of just saying open carry is bad, concealed carry is bad. Because we have quite a bit of evidence that people do both in this country. Uh, Let's see. Give me one more second. All right. I like this one. So there are two different takes on things like convoy security uh, that were big in the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. So one take on security is if we look like big brute monsters with huge ass guns and huge bomb proof trucks, we're much more safe because people won't want to start a fight with us. I think that in the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, we have seen that that logic is false. (laughs) While you may be slightly better equipped to handle a firefight, if your weapons are bigger and badder and more out in the open, yeah, you might be a little more equipped to handle a gunfight, but you're also, yes, in that case, you do make yourself a target. Sure. There's another approach um, that happened overseas, which was we're going to buy local cars we're not going to walk, we either are or are not going to wash our car to fit in with whatever the local standard is. And we're going to dress like the locals and we're going to drive like the locals. That way we're not picking a fight, but we still have some guns. We've seen definite pros and cons for both of those situations. This, I was going to do this at the end, but I'm going to jump the lot, jump the uh, curriculum here a little bit. I think that one of the big conclusion points is you should stop ordering people what to do and just let people open carry if they want to open carry and let people conceal carry if they want to conceal carry. The unfortunate part is we live in a country now that is not a free country where almost everything you do and you don't do is governed by fucking hundreds of thousands of laws of which we could never read and never know them. And they change all the time too, which is odd, right? If something is moral one day, how could it be immoral the next day? And then moral again, if someone behind a desk changes their mind. So 
it's unfortunate that we have this legal issue behind the tactical issue, um, but that's that's the world we live in for now. Um, I I don't even I don't have a problem with this argument from the tactical point of view. If I had a choice, I would. If it were, uh, if it wouldn't land me in a jail cell or dead, and I don't mean dead because of an active shooter, I mean dead because of police shooting me. If it were legal, I would much prefer to open carry. It's so much easier, so much more convenient for me. I would not open carry everywhere, um, but it would it would make trips to the grocery store and things like that much easier. And things like road trips, um, it's a fucking pain in the dick to get just the right concealed carry holster and to make sure you're not uh, you're not printing your weapon underneath your shirt. And you're, you often have to use a smaller weapon and then you can't just strap an extra magazine to your belt. You have to hide it as well and you have to get a special holster for it. So it sucks, but I would probably open carry much, much more if it were legal. Um, what I don't think is helping this debate is, uh, is, is people framing it as an I'm right, you're wrong argument. Cause again, just like we said at the very beginning, both sides can be right at the same time. And both sides can be right in different scenarios. And really, you, you should have a choice in this free country, right? Huh. <laughs> you should have a choice in this free-ish country to do whatever the fuck you want, as long as you're not victimizing someone. So, a lot to think about. Uh, this is going to be a really short episode. Um, well, I talked about my conclusion in the beginning, and then in the middle, and then just again at the end. So, I'm pretty sure you know my thoughts, but... I just wanted to put a little bit more out there on the debate, um, on the tactical side of things, which tactic is better. If I had to choose, I would probably, if I had to choose only one or the other, like throw away all my concealed carry holsters or throw away all my open carry holsters, I would definitely open carry and get rid of all the concealed stuff. That would be my choice. Um, I would love to hear your thoughts on this. Uh, A couple good places to get in touch with me. So let's do uh, some housekeeping here at the end. If you want to head over to the website, you now can still type in uncensoredtactical.com and that'll bring you there. Or much shorter, you can just type in utac.io. That's our new shortcut to the website. That'll bring you to the same place. You could also email me if you have some long format feedback. A good place for that is my email. And we're shifting everything over to pat at utac.io. Much, much shorter. And we're not giving, giving Google all of our business now. What else do we got? I'm active on Instagram. That's at Uncensored Tactical. Yeah, that's a pretty good place to drop me some some short feedback. You can DM me or you can comment on my posts there. Uh, If you want to get into the Discord that I'm on, that's a pretty cool place. That link will be in the show notes on today's article and on most of most of the articles that we do. That's going to be a subscribe star account that is linked to the Insurgency Knitting Circle podcast. I share their chat room and their Discord area um, with Texas Joe, who runs that podcast. Um, I'll also be teaching with Texas Joe this coming, let's see, April 9th, 10th, and 11th. We'll be teaching together, so that's going to be a pretty cool event. I don't know if there's any seats available for that, but that's going to be a pretty cool homesteading course. I'm also teaching in late April. Let me give the dates to you. I'm going to pause this. April 29th and 30th, which is a Thursday and a Friday, and that's going to be just outside Memphis, Tennessee. It's with a, The website is energeticentry.com. And that is T-E-E-S, T's is the company, Tactical Energetic Entry Systems is what it's saying here on the website. The easiest way to sign up for that is to go to my website, utac.io, just click on the training courses tab. I'll do that with you right now so I can make sure you're getting the best info, utac.io. If you're on your desktop computer or uh, if you're on your phone, you can click the menu option at the top. But there is a tab on top that says training courses 2021. Click on that. There's a little bit of general info up up top and a good podcast uh, explanation of the course up top. There's a little short video and you scroll down and you'll see the March course is still there. I'm going to delete that because that has been completed. April 9th, 10th, and 11th is our Houston, Texas homesteading course. And April 29th and 30th in Bihalia, Mississippi is the next course for tactical lock picking. We have, we're limiting it to eight seats, so I don't know how many people are signed up now, so you might want to jump on that quick if you want to train with me. That's a great place to do it. If you click on the link on my website, that'll bring you over to their website, which is energeticentry.com, right to the sign-up page. Um, it is open to the public. Uh, we recommend that you be for a prior 
or current first responders of any type or military. Um, but you are more than welcome to come if you're a member of the public and you are interested in security. Uh, email me if you have any questions. Again, that's pat at utac.io. And I'll spend maybe two or three minutes talking about the dog. So she's fantastic. She's about six and a half months old today. Um, I have a female Dutch Shepherd. And everybody says, oh my God, that's a beautiful Malinois. And I go, well, it's not really a Malinois. But uh, if you ask Joel over on his podcast at Protection Dog Podcast, um, he's got some thoughts about the breeding, which is uh, pretty unique. So people get really, really wrapped around this uh, AKC or American Kennel Club definition list and breeding and purebred. And so he's got a really down to earth take on it. Um, so when people ask me, oh, what is she? I say Dutch Shepherd and they go, oh, this, that, the other. And I go, oh, sure. Okay, whatever. So it's not a big deal for me. Um, I guess a lot. <laughs> and the punchline is people love paper and they love paperwork and they love certificates. I don't. Um, and probably most of you that listen to, to this podcast are probably less enthused about certificates now. Um, but I'm more concerned about what my dog can do rather than what her family tree looks like. So she's happy. She's healthy. She's strong as fuck. Uh, she's a problem solver. So we had her out on Joel's uh, at his facility the other day, and we were doing things with her she, she'd never done before. So there's a about five foot high uh, solid wood plank wall, and we had her try and jump that, and she walked up to it and put her feet up and went, nope. And so we gave her a little cheat and we gave her a little stool so that she can do like a double jump. And she did a little better, but thought, oh, I don't know. So we pushed her again. She did the same thing, hopped on the little stool, hopped up on the five foot wall and then jumped over. She was so pumped. Uh, so we did it again with no little, or we did it maybe a second or third time. And I had a buddy with me who's actually on the discord right now chatting with me. And he said he's, he was on one side of the op obstacle. I was on the far side or the landing side. And so he was like, dude, she's like ghost stepping that little stool. And it's kind of in a way making it worse. Like she's confused. And I was like, great, good news. So we took the stool, threw it to the side and ran the five foot wall, five foot high jump wall. She just dominated the whole thing all the way up, all the way over. It was awesome. Uh, and then she did a bunch of stuff. That's really advanced agility that, um, you know, most of your common house dogs and lap dogs don't get to do. So we had her, there's a small platform, maybe a foot and a half off the ground. And on that platform is a, like a regular runged ladder. And that ladder is at an angle up to a bigger box. So it's almost a horizontal ladder, but there's a slight incline. Um, and she had never done that before. So she learned how to walk across a slotted and runged ladder, which was really cool. She did really well with that. And then there's a, uh, if you've ever been a kid at a playground, sometimes they have those like wooden planks that run left to right. Like if you're walking on them, they run left to right but they're connected by chains. So they kind of like they jingle or like they, they kind of, they kind of bounce up and down a little bit with the rest of the, the bridge that you walk across. So it's like a chain link bridge, but there's wooden planks running across. So she had to walk across that and there were some huge gaps and she actually fell through once or twice, but we picked her right back up, put her right back on. Um, and she was determined and she didn't have any quit in her. It was really cool to see that part of it. Like that was probably the most enjoyable part was her falling and trying to hang on and getting that last foot up and just clawing her way back up onto the obstacle and making it over. I mean, that was so cool to see that. Um, what else? Everything else is going smooth. We haven't had a bathroom problem in the house in months. Uh, she is really clear that she's crate trained and potty trained. So uh, she sleeps in the crate maybe two, three nights a week. Uh, she's still in the crate about, I don't know, about nine hours a day when I'm at work, five days a week. And she does just fine and she's happy. She's healthy, happy, no problems. So if you live in a small apartment, you too can own a dog um, and don't feel bad about them. Like this, this is their job. Everyone has a job. These dogs have a job. She's a working dog. Um, I spend nine hours a day inside a box that I don't want to be in. And she does too. So <laughs> if you think of it that way, it's like, oh, wow, good point. Yeah, I'm leaving and I would much rather be home and free and walking around naked. So my dog... Uh, when I go to work, she goes to work, although her work is in her crate for nine hours. It's a big crate. She's fine. So those are some updates on her. Um, I do have an affiliate program with Fortress K9. If you want a high quality dog like I have, or if you want some high quality training, or if you just want to check out a cool podcast, head over to Joel's place. And that's going to be the Protection Dog Podcast. You can find them on most podcast outlets. His website is Fortress K9. 
and then the letter K and the number nine dot com, fortress K nine dot com. Um, on Instagram, he is fortress K nine. Let me type it in to make sure I'm giving you the best information. None of this wishy washy stuff. Open up Instagram. We're going to search F O R T. Yep. It's all one word fortress, the letter K, the number nine, no spaces. And you'll see the, the white background with the kind of like the three tiered castle. And that is one of Joel's Instagram pages. The other one is fortress, uh, fortress dot puppies. And there's a, a new litter on the ground right now of puppies and they are just awesome. I went and saw them the other day. Um, so if you want a awesome dog from Joel, he's got different levels of entry. Some are the untrained puppy, some are the trained puppy, and then some are the advanced dogs that of course go up in cost as you go. Uh, and you can get yourself a, a uncensored tactical discount over with Joel. Just let him know that I sent you. And in return, he will help support my show here. So that is almost everything I have for you. Unless I'm forgetting something. Oh, one more note that I usually don't go over. Uh, if you're missing me for the week and if I'm busy behind the scenes and I can't get my podcast out for the week, you can also go over to my website, utac.io. And you can click on the link that says Pat on other platforms. Uh, I do talk a lot about... Um, some non-tactical stuff on other people's shows. I talk quite a bit about the Liberty topics. Um, but the last few shows I've been on were the Lock Sportcast, where we talked with Charles over from that podcast. The Lock Sportcast is on most podcast platforms. That was pretty cool. We went really deep on the most recent book that I just published. I was also on Homesteads and Homeschools, that podcast. Their title was Picking It With Pat. That was in February. Um, that was a pretty cool show. We talked a little bit more about things like homesteads, um, and I mentioned to him that I was I would love to start teaching a uh, security block to homeschool families. I think that'd be cool. Um, I was also on Timeline Earth, The Signal, January 15th. Excuse me. Uh, that was to discuss the homesteading course um, that Texas Joe and I will be teaching in April 9th, 10th, and 11th. So those are the last few ones that we did. Uh, Agorist Nexus was another one, October 30th, 2020. Uh, and all these links, again, are on my page. So if you miss me on this show, you can catch me on other people's shows as well. And that is all I have for you today. Short episode, but I thought it would be a cool topic to breach. Um, no pun intended. Oh, God. No, no, no. Uh, I am thinking I'll probably have another episode out either tomorrow or the next day. So I'm going to try and get two out for you this week. All right, folks. Thanks for, thanks for spending some time with me. It really means a lot to me. Um, I'll see you on the next one. <laughs>